Hey everyone, welcome back to another lesson. This lesson is on vitamin B3 or niacin deficiency. So vitamin B3 or niacin is also known as nicotinic acid or nicotinamide. So this is what vitamin B3 looks like. Vitamin B3 is a water-soluble vitamin and it is actually one of eight B vitamins. Now niacin deficiency, the condition we're gonna talk about in this lesson, is also known as pellagra. So we're gonna talk about the clinical features and some of the other ways of diagnosing and treating it later on in this lesson. Why do we need vitamin B3 or niacin to begin with? We need it for several processes. One of them is nutrient metabolism. So very important, we require vitamin B3 for nutrient metabolism, metabolism of proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. And we also need it for cholesterol and fatty acid synthesis. What are some of the sources of vitamin B3? So the dietary sources of vitamin B3 include the following, fortified cereals and grains. So cereals and grains that have had niacin added to them artificially. We can also find it in meat and fish, legumes, and to a lesser extent in nuts, tea, and coffee. And we can also get niacin from endogenous synthesis. So endogenous synthesis means we are making it inside our own bodies. And we actually do this through hepatic synthesis through synthesis in our liver. And what happens is niacin or vitamin B3 is synthesized in our liver from tryptophan. And this process requires riboflavin. And the recommended daily intake of niacin is the following. 16 milligrams per day for males, 14 milligrams per day for females, and for pregnant individuals, 18 milligrams per day. So why do we need vitamin B3 or niacin to begin with? Well, we actually need it for the production of a couple of important cofactors. And these include nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD, and nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, or NADP. So with regards to NAD, or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, this is a carrier of chemical energy, allowing generation of ATP, adenosine triphosphate, so the cell's energy source. But it's also required for other enzymes as well. So the enzymes that require NAD as a cofactor include the following. Enzymes in alcohol metabolism require NAD. So alcohol dehydrogenase requires NAD. We also see it in glycolysis. So glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase requires it. The Krebs cycle. So we can see it in enzymes like alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. And we can also see it in fat catabolism as well. With regards to NADP, this is involved in the pentose phosphate pathway. So we can remember the P here, NADP, P for pentose phosphate pathway. And it's required for enzymes in the following processes. So it's generated in the pentose phosphate pathway and it's required for enzymes in fatty acid synthesis, oxidative stress homeostasis, and cytochrome P450 system in the liver. So again, very important. NAD and NADP required for all these processes. So again, a lot of processes here you might not need to know, but it's important to recognize that a lot of times NAD is a carrier of chemical energy when it's reduced to NADH and it allows the generation of ATP in the electron transport chain in the mitochondria. And it's also involved in other processes as well, alcohol metabolism being one of them. And then NADP generated in the pentose phosphate pathway and required for processes like fatty acid synthesis, which is important as well. So how is vitamin B3 absorbed and excreted? We talked about those sources of vitamin B3, including dietary sources and hepatic synthesis or synthesis in the liver. And we need both of those processes to actually maintain proper, adequate amounts of vitamin B3. So when we ingest it in our diet, we ingest it it enters into our gastrointestinal tract. And if it's in the form of NAD or NADP, when we ingest it, we have to actually process it to nicotinamide to allow the absorption of the vitamin B3. So it could be in one of these forms. We have to convert it into nicotinamide in order to absorb it. Most of the time it's absorbed in the small intestine, although some can be absorbed from the stomach. And again, it's absorbed in the forms of nicotinamide and niacin. So it becomes absorbed then it enters into the bloodstream. And eventually it'll lead to the kidneys where it is excreted in the urine. So that was a very brief explanation of the absorption and excretion of vitamin B3. So what causes vitamin B3 deficiency? So we mentioned that we get vitamin B3 from dietary sources, but also liver synthesis from tryptophan. So as we'll see here, 
these two both play roles in leading to vitamin B3 deficiency. So the first category of causes is poor dietary intake. So this makes sense. If you're not eating enough niacin and you're not eating enough tryptophan because you can also make it in your liver from tryptophan, you're going to have low amounts of niacin or low amounts of vitamin B3. So one of the states is alcoholism. So chronic alcoholism, a lot of times individuals with chronic alcoholism don't eat a whole lot in general. So they're going to have issues with getting enough niacin and tryptophan. Malnutrition for the same reason. Vegan diet. So although we did talk about some fortified grains and cereals and legumes, we often get a lot of vitamin B3 from meats and fish. So certain vegan diets can lead to a vitamin B3 deficiency. Fasting and starvation, again, due to similar reasons we talked about before, and anorexia nervosa as well. The second category of causes is decreased synthesis. So we need both oral intake through our diet of niacin or vitamin B3, but you also need some of that synthesis from tryptophan to make enough niacin for adequate levels of vitamin B3. So if you don't have enough synthesis, you're going to have some vitamin B3 deficiency as well. One of them is liver disease because as we mentioned before, tryptophan is processed into niacin in the liver. So if there's any issue with the liver, this process might be disrupted. Another cause of decreased synthesis is carcinoid syndrome. So carcinoid syndrome is a perineoplastic syndrome and it's really due to a carcinoid cancer that is producing excessive amounts of serotonin. So what happens is that excessive amounts of serotonin is produced from tryptophan. So it consumes tryptophan. So we don't have enough tryptophan to make vitamin B3. And another cause of decreased synthesis of vitamin B3 is deficiency of riboflavin and iron. So I don't know if you remember me mentioning it before, but I talked about hepatic synthesis requires tryptophan. So we use tryptophan to produce niacin, but we also need riboflavin for this process as well. And we also need iron. I didn't mention that before, but we also need iron for this process as well. So if you're deficient in riboflavin and iron, you can have a niacin deficiency or vitamin B3 deficiency. Another category of causes is decreased absorption. So we just talked about absorption. If you're not absorbing it from your small intestine, you can have issues actually having enough vitamin B3. Some of these include inflammatory bowel disease. So there's inflammation due to Crohn's, for instance, that's affecting parts of the small intestine. This can lead to decreased absorption of vitamins in general. Hartnup disease is another cause. This is actually an autosomal recessive condition that leads to reduced tryptophan absorption. So it is a genetic cause, but it really is a decreased absorption, but really decreased synthesis as well. So it can fit into multiple categories. So reduced tryptophan absorption. So you don't have enough tryptophan to produce vitamin B3 in the liver. And then GI surgery in general, if there's large amounts of the gastrointestinal system that are removed, then you won't have the surface area to actually absorb vitamin B3. And then finally, the last category here we're going to talk about is medications. So the medications that can cause vitamin B3 deficiency, especially if they're used for long periods of time, include the following. One of them is isoniazid. So this is the one that you're actually going to see that's most often talked about with regards to causing vitamin B3 deficiency. But we can also see it with 5-fluorouracil, azathioprine, pyrazinamide, and phenobarbital use as well. Now let's talk about pellagra or niacin deficiency. So what are the clinical features of pellagra? So pellagra is the term we use for niacin deficiency, and it has a particular mnemonic that helps remember the clinical features. It's known as the four Ds diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. So you're going to see this mnemonic being used for Ds to help remember the clinical features of pellagra, but we're going to talk about the signs and symptoms in more detail here as well. So the first is gastrointestinal. So the first D, diarrhea. So diarrhea we're going to see in pellagra, but we can also see vomiting as well. We're now going to look at the integumentary system. So the integumentary system is your skin, and this is the second D, dermatitis. More specifically, though, the dermatitis is pigmented or hyperpigmented. So it can look oftentimes like this. So you can see here it's hyperpigmented. It's often due to photosensitivity. So areas of the body that are exposed to the sun are going to get this hyperpigmented dermatitis. And it's also symmetric. So as you can see in these images here, it's on both sides. It's bilateral. It's symmetric. So we can see it being a symmetric pigmented or hyperpigmented dermatitis, and it's due to photosensitivity. You can see it here as well. And then we can also see something known as Cassell's necklace, 
and sorry again for the pronunciation. So you can see something like this on a patient's neck who has pellagra. So you can see this type of a hyperpigmented skin lesion. And again, this is due to sun exposure in that area. We can also see glossitis, so an inflammation of the tongue. So it can be a red tongue. And we can see alopecia, so hair loss as well, being a sign of pellagra. There are also neurological findings in pellagra as well. These include anxiety, insomnia, peripheral neuropathy, delusions, so fixed false beliefs, disorientation, so patients are not sure about their surroundings, depression, encephalopathy, so an altered mental status, and can lead to dementia and ultimately into a coma and can progress to death. So these also talk about the third D here, dementia, and then the fourth D would be death. And some other clinical features of pellagra include headache and fatigue. And these can also tie in with these neurological findings as well. So as you can see, the clinical features of pellagra are the four Ds, diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and death. But we can see there's a lot of other little details here with regards to the symptomatology. So again, it affects gastrointestinal system, integumentary system, and neurological system. So how is pellagra evaluated and how is it treated? So the evaluation of pellagra involves measuring niacin metabolites in the urine. So these metabolites are excreted in urine and can be measured. And if the urinary excretion rate of these metabolites is less than 5.8 micromoles per day, that indicates niacin deficiency. And how is it treated? So quite simply, if an individual is low in niacin, we give them niacin. So niacin is given, niacin supplementation. And it can be given by mouth or IM, so an IM injection, an intramuscular injection. So again, measure niacin metabolites in urine. If it's less than 5.8 micromoles per day, that indicates deficiency. And niacin supplementation is often used. And a lot of times because these individuals may be deficient in other B vitamins, a B complex vitamin will also be oftentimes used for these individuals. So if you want to learn more about other vitamin deficiencies, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please consider liking, subscribing, and clicking the notification bell to help support the channel and stay up to date on future lessons. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you next time.